My name is Anna Inario, and I'm part of the team that um, creates and organizes the Park Forum, so we're very pleased for, for you to come today. We are very happy to have Karen Weber um, come to the Park Forum today. She's part of the education team at Microsoft. She's an experienced architect and storyteller, and is partner director for the education workshop um, at Microsoft. She's, her team is responsible in incubating K-12 education. <clears throat> She's also contributed in advancing strategy for the Xbox, right? The Xbox One, Xbox Live, and Windows um, Phone. She's also been with Pixar, Yahoo, um, SGI, and, and an alumni here at Park for nine years. So we're very happy to have her back. She holds about 40 patents, I think, 40 patents, and has credits on four films, four films, um, from Pixar, two of them which won uh, Academy Awards. Um, and on the side, she likes to sail as well as she's a huge soccer fan. So please um, give a warm welcome to one of our Park alums, Karen Weber. Thank you. It's a really on a great honor to be back. And, um, you know, when I got the call from Anna, to come and, and see if I could come talk, she asked me, well, do you have slides? And I was thinking about it, and I'm like, what do you mean do I have slides? I work at Microsoft. We traffic and PowerPoint. Of course I have slides. And then I realized that maybe that wasn't what she was actually asking me. Maybe she wanted me to come and give a park talk with my slides. Um, I came in and asking for a slide carousel and for um, a projector, and they laughed at me. Um, I'm like, come on, don't you have retro technology here as well as modern technology? Um, so if anybody afterwards wants to come hold them up to the light, they're actually pretty cool. Um, and uh, it's pretty cool. So as uh, Anna mentioned, I'm from Microsoft. I work in the education workshop. We are a small little incubation team. Um, and for me, this is a very special moment. This is a first time back in about uh, almost 25 years. Um, and I am honored to be back because this is really where I think a lot about um, how and uh, my career was influenced and the journey that I took um, as an adult um, was highly influenced by my time here at Park. Someone once told me, Park is a great place to begin your career or end your career. I came in the front door at the beginning. Um, we'll talk about it later, about what tend to happen at the end of my career. Um, while I was at Park, I worked on an amazing set of technologies. And these technologies were everything from electronic media centered um, communications um, to actually looking at ink and pen and real time note taking techniques. Um, I had the honor of working with some amazing people. I did a bunch of work on gesture and input um, and really looked at asynchronous communication and was introduced to the world of signal processing um, and algorithms. Um, but before I sort of talk about education and skills, um, I think it's really important to sort of stop for a moment and give, with your indulgence, um, I'd like to share with you a personal story. So it's really about future-ready skills, um, which is what I'm going to tell you about. So I was raised by two educators. My father was a professor of architecture, and my mom a high school biology teacher and high school counselor. That meant that I grew up with lots of pens and pencils and trace paper and markers um, in my dad's studio and fetal pigs in my basement. It's really important that you understand the, the convergence of those two ideas um, because my parents raised me to be a steminist, someone who was curious, someone who knew how to ask good questions, someone who could develop frustration resistance, super important, so you can know how to have patient problem solving, um, be able to articulate what I would think was true, and then also be able to relate it to something else. This shouldn't seem like a, a big moment or a big denouement for anyone, but you know, the notion that my parents were thoughtful about actually giving me an inquiry-based learning framework to grow up with really was seminal in how I started to look at my education, let alone the education of others. For those of you who think about um, inquiry-based learning only in the sciences, let me point out this awesome, awesome um, graphic that I found here on the, the topic of shoes and how shoes can be scientific and how shoes can be part of literature and how shoes can be part of social studies and economics. And as a fan of shoes, I thought that this was really important to basically say, hey, look, 
You know, inquiry-based frameworks are a way of living. It's a way of approaching how you think about the world and how you see yourself in the world and how you move forward um, within that world. Well, and, and for a while, you know, it was great. I was on track. I was a good student. I loved reading. I, you know, built things. I was out in the environment and in the world. And um, I even had an opportunity um, to go make water with a chemist at a university. So, you know, you should have said at that point, this girl is well on her way to a good career in STEM. I even got a job in fifth grade. My very first job was a laboratory caretaker at a psych lab. My job was to be the human handler of the rats, and then the, the psychologists would come in, and the university students would come in, and they would work on it. So, you know, again, set up for success to be in the world of STEM. And it was good pay. But actually, the thing that made me most excited was all the free plotter paper that it gave me. And I used that for drawing, and I used that for making books. And at that point, my parents should have known that I was headed to the arts. That, that, that nice foundation of engineering, architecture, and science wasn't come, rubbing off on this daughter. Um, and then they found out for sure. I turned 13. Um, and yeah, those really are my pants. Um, and do not hold that against me. I think I've gotten a little bit better with age. But the important thing about turning 13 for me at that time was I discovered I no longer really liked math. I also discovered I really only liked the life sciences. And my time outside of school was spent as an athlete. Turns out, I was a textbook case. If you look at young women in the mid-70s, that's exactly what. We had a self-perceived vision that we could not do math. It did not mean that we couldn't do math. I took calculus in high school. But I didn't think I could do math. I also found out, you know, as I started to look at the statistical norm, knowing and being, wanting to be in the life sciences is exactly where lots of women were ending up. And I was influenced highly by the mentors of my time. I am a product in a generation of Title IX, and I was super inspired by Billie Jean King, was cheering when she beat Bobby Riggs, and started to see that there was this opportunity to actually be an independent, liberated woman. Turns out, however, the state of STEM is not that much better. Um, yeah, this many years forward, we still have a disparate... Um, a gender uh, difference between men and women working in computer science and especially in engineering. And so why we might have 60% of females in social sciences or 48% of women in life sciences, today we only have 15% of women in engineering and 26% of women in computer science. So why is this important? Because it turns out now that we have some time to do some analysis, that there is this small little window between 11 and a half and 15, where if you can get a young woman interested in STEM, show her some mentorship, give her some, some um, opportunities to see that anything in science, technology, engineering, and math can be fun, you have a chance to get them to reconsider that as a career later on in their life. If you don't, they're gone. They become sort of like me. So I went to high school, graduated with a foundation in two things, knowledge academics and implied skills. I'm going to take two seconds here and talk about those two concepts. Because one of the things that's happening in education right now is that when we look at what students could be learning and should be learning, we get confused between those two kinds of concepts. So liberal arts are those things that we all assume are traditional knowledge academics, literature, history, social studies, science, math, and languages. What is not well understood is this sort of collection of practical arts, applied skills, things like physical education or art or performing arts or woodshop or driver's ed. How many of you took typing in high school or in middle school? Yeah, for me, that was a foundational skill. It actually was the key that allowed me to transition from the analog to the digital. So all the things I left high school with, who would have thought the class that I thought was the slack off class was really turned out to be the core fundamental skill that allowed me to move into the digital age? It's kind of an interesting thought, isn't it? So for me, I hung out in all of my electives, and that's what they called them in those days, um, were, were learning by doing. I took home ec, I took woodshop, I took journalism. And in each case, you know, 
they were they were important courses, but you know, if you were to think about it, someone would say, well, but it's not literature, history, arts, and sciences. I propose that what we really need is to look at those as an interconnected set of principles. That some percentage of liberal arts plus some percentage of practical arts will really lead three things. Either life skills, professional skills, or mandated skills. Now, I know you all know about mandated skills. Those are the ones that the standards that are applied, in, at least in the US, um, every student has to meet a bar on. And internationally, they change. There are some international standards, like the ISTE standards, or the, um, um, which are sort of international. But the idea is, is that the government tells you what you're supposed to learn and what you, what you need to know to matriculate. A professional skill, we all know what that is. It's like, well, I'm going to go do, I'm going to take auto body shop. I'm going to become an auto mechanic. Easy peasy. But what's really interesting is what a life skill is and how do you find the balance between a life skill and a professional skill. And we get confused often between those. So for me, it was pretty interesting. I took shop. I never thought anything about it. Who would have thought that many, many years later, it was really handy that not only did I know how to use a hammer and nail to fix my home, but I would actually start using it in my job as well. So it transitioned. For me, home economics, yeah, I made a really ugly apron in middle school. It wasn't the apron that was important. For me, it was the first time I actually learned to think from a 2D flat form to a 3D volumetric form. And that act of moving from 2D to 3D highly influenced where I would end up later on in my career, i.e. computer graphics and animation. So, I then became focused on the humanities. And I'm not going to spend time, this is not like, let's review Karen's life and here's her resume. But what's important to know is that I got a degree in film. I was hired in broadcast television, and then was hired as a producer and director for a corporate science documentaries unit um, to do media communications and support. Now, it turns out many years, I discovered I wasn't really a lost feminist. I discovered that the arts actually led me to the T in STEM, to technology. And I transitioned from a producer and director to an interface designer to an inventor today to now a hacker. I went from telling stories about people, places, and things to telling stories about people using technology to telling stories of using technology to help people solve their problems in their stories to helping people use technology to solve their own problems in their stories. That transition was really interesting for me. But the big question is, hey, where the heck did you just acquire those T skills? You were a filmmaker, and now you're an inventor. How do those things come together? Well, for those who don't know, it happened right here. In this very room, the corporate video gig was Park. And my first job was actually producing the Park Forums. Hey, Joe, I had Joe's job. I lived up in the booth. I dealt with the audio problems, the same audio problems that we're going to have in a little while here. I dealt with then. Nothing has changed. I know technology has changed, but not the audio in the park, forum, uh, park uh, auditorium. But what was really important was, was that I got to grow. And Park gave me that opportunity to develop new skills and new ways of thinking that I otherwise would have never, ever been exposed to. So how did it happen? Well, George Paik, namesake of this awesome uh, auditorium, had the labs in his day. And he had a communications group led by a woman named Gloria Warner. And Gloria had this small team. And I hear Susie Mulhern is still here today. So I'm kind of bummed she's not in the audience, because I would have really loved to have called her out on this. But, so they were, they were the team that did all of the communications work. And in 1986, a new project was ramping up called Media Spaces. I don't know if any of you know of that work or have seen that work. But basically, they had a multidisciplinary team that was looking at um, how you could bring video and computing together and bring them into the workplace. So that notion of Xerox and video documents and the ability to think about bringing video into your place. So those of you who use Skype or Teams or Zoom or anything, a lot of that beginning of work started right here. And that was what I was on. What was interesting was, from a skills standpoint, the team was computer scientists, social scientists, and designers, and architects. 
They didn't have anybody on the team that had deep work practice in media. And so they recruited me out of the booth and into the labs within six months. Now, that was a tr crazy transition. Think about this for a moment. Um, I didn't, first of all, when I first got here, I didn't even know where I'd landed. Um, they gave me an alto. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, again, dating myself, slides and altos, okay. Um, nonetheless, uh, they started talking about these things called interfaces. And I kept thinking about from home ec, that's the thing you sew into the bottom of a hem to keep it straight and keep it stiff. Like, what are these computer scientists doing with sewing and interfacing? Yet over time, what I was very excited to do, learn was that the generous community that I was working with really taught me what they were doing. They shared their knowledge, they shared their insight, they explained what was going on. And the biggest lesson that I walked away with was all of them, all of them were learning by doing. They were stepping up and asking questions. They were using those skills of frustration resistance. They were using um, the best opportunities that they had to make a difference and to understand what was happening going forward. Now, over the last couple of weeks, I've tried to think of every single person that I have met um, during those time, and I already have, have to come back and fix my slide because I've forgotten some. But it was a revolutionary change for me. But it didn't come without a price, and it didn't come without a gift. And that gift came from mentorship. And not only did I get mentorship from the women that I worked with here, but Gloria Warner pulled me aside on the night before I went and started my, next, my new gig and told me, go dress like them so they'll treat you like an equal and don't confuse you with the administrative staff. I point this out not to bear shame, but to bear thanks that Gloria Warner understood. As George Paik's EA executive, she knew what it was going to take to survive in an environment that I was not used to. I'll give you a really dumb example. And I was super excited. I walked into the lobby and I saw this picture up there. Um, this picture here, a couple important things to note. First of all, these are the women. And they're all in the beanbag chairs. Now, if I was wearing a cutie cute skirt, how the heck am I supposed to come to a meeting in a beanbag room? Thank you, Gloria. Thank you, Gloria. Two, by the way, she's smoking. Who smoked in the office? Come on. It happened here, by the way. They would give you, like, they, people would have like little fan things and it would suck the smoke up. But nonetheless, it's important to recognize this. I tell you this story not to share my career, but to tell you that as a woman in STEM and a woman who went through this transition, it has not been easy and it still isn't easy. Now, I was lucky, like I said. I got help crossing the chasm. And we can see for you today in women, in STEM, there are lots of programs and lots of organizations that have stood up and said, we are going to help you get across that chasm. Obviously, Microsoft has been one of them. But there's now a new growing challenge. So we think, OK, it's just the gender diversity that's, that's the problem that we're having in schools. We'll just get girls to like STEM. We'll get them to really think about the fact that they could be mentored, and, the, and, and we'll get them across the chasm. But that's not the problem. The question is, what skills do our scholars actually need today, to learn today, to get ready for tomorrow? Now, I have no idea if Ray's Kurzweil's curve is correct, but the best thing about it, other than the fact um, is that it was available, is that it's straight up. And I can't tell you what's happened in 2006, 7, 8, 9, 10 up to now, but we know that middle school and high school curriculum is not keeping up with the pace of technology. So for example, there have been clarion calls. Many of you probably participated and know about, in 2006, Computer Science for All Initiative and President Obama's Office of Technology and Innovation. A national call was put forth to bring computer science into the classroom. This was an important shift to recognize that we had an entire generation that wasn't going to be prepared for these skills and for these jobs that were coming in the future. So what happened? They gave CS love and they put it all into schools. 39 states as of today plus DC actually have computer science can satisfy a high school graduation requirement. 
And organizations like Code.org started with things like Hour of Code. Many of your kids may have been in those. Um, they also have Days of Code. Um, December is coming up. It's a month of code. And they figured out where to stick it in the curriculum. They also looked at how to scaffold students so you could start some in, in kindergarten. So basically getting from loops to regression by the time you were out in, in, in college, on your way to college. And there are now standards. The Computer Science Teachers Society got together and they built a set of standards that now you can actually assess kids with and understand that skill. So cool, the framework changed. If you look at sort of high school graduation and requirements, I picked this one from Washington State where I'm from, you can see that we get 15 credits in liberal arts, nine credits in applied skills in practical arts, um, and those now still have their skills. Now, that might be enough, but it's not. Progress is being made and it's slow, right? Really, only 15 states actually require CS for all high schools. There are only 33 states that are going to certify their teachers. And for pre-service, which is teacher college, there are only 13 states that are providing a higher ed computer science teacher de degree. That's a problem. If we don't have enough educators and we're not putting this into the schools. And by the way, we only dealt with CS. What about all the rest of the skills in STEM? We didn't get to the other parts of like science or, or engineering or, or data or, or any of the other kinds of things. Where do those fit in the, those 15 hours or nine hours of electives? So my team asked, can you align middle school curriculum to student development pathways? Can we move from what we're seeing happening in the classroom from the 19th century three R's of reading, writing, and arithmetic, which, by the way, only one starts with an R. So whoever decided in education that they're going to call these things the three R's didn't even look how they were spelled. And transition to something like we were learning by doing to 21st century six C's. There's an amazing professor at the University of Toronto, Michael Fullan, who said, every student needs to have these six C's. Creativity, critical thinking, collaboration, communication, citizenship, and character. I love those last two. I don't see those from any other scholars. And so I always include those because if I were to think about what I would want a student to have, in my case, in a lot of those, I think those are almost the most important to citizenship and character. Now, you look across the World Economic Forum and you say, well, how, how do you think those are? Are those, are those coming into those top desirable skills? And it sure, sure is. In fact, I love this, this statistic. So in 2015, creativity was down here at number 10. Creativity's moved up to number three. That's pretty cool. Like, we're starting to understand. We need innovative, creative people. We need people who know how to do critical thinking. We need to have people who know how to communicate and collaborate. And if you go on LinkedIn, which I like to think of as the home of all jobs, the top soft skills, leadership, communication, collaboration, and obviously time management. Um, I'm not good on that one. But it's a combination of those hard skills and soft skills. And when we start to look at the hard skills, no one's going to be surprised by this list. Data engineering and warehousing, mobile development, um, user interface design, statistical analysis and data mining. Well, where in the heck is that going to show up in the curriculum? I'm worried. I'm worried that when we look at that list of applied skills and we only have nine credits, that's not, that's not time to start trying to start to introduce that stuff. We have to start earlier. We have to think earlier. So what do we do with this existing gap? So my team took a deep breath and we said, okay, our ambition is to now modernize STEM education to enable every student on the planet to achieve more. And when I talk about modernize, what I really mean is develop skills that model real world jobs and engage students solving real world problems. And when I talk about every student, I want to remove the economic barriers. So think about that for a moment. What does it cost to set up a STEM classroom? What does it cost? It's not just a computer. And oh, by the way, don't call it just the 3D printer and the library and you're done. It really is, what do you need? What would I have to put in place? So we stepped back and we spent some time and looked at that. And our hypothesis said that if we could build a set of master skills 
that led students to care, we could lead them to careers. I know, and it only works in English, but think about that. Care to career, you just added an R and S. Like, come on, you know, you are, like, this is a good thing. This is not, shouldn't be that hard to do. And it uses the same framework of inquiry-based learning. So we went, and we talked to a lot of teachers. And we went in and we started to say, tell us what you teach. Show us your scaffolding. Show us your syllabus. Let us understand how you get from fourth to eighth grade. And we went and looked at the National um, Next Generation Science Standards and the ISTE standards and tried to understand how they use that design loop and how they put this emphasis on computational and design thinking to move students through a phenomenon-based experience that has them look at science, engineering, and data. Our initial study said, hey, you've got to go figure out the curriculum, check. But you also have to look at real-time data. And we were like, what do you mean? These kids were doing these projects. They were doing the science. But there was no feedback coming to them. So we said, let's go figure that out. Let's go look at how we build a methodology. So we worked with teachers to do that. So skill development means do it twice methodology. You teach it once, and they do something on their own afterwards to show you that they've acquired it. Let's look at how we can do some um, data analysis. And let's scaffold from the analog to the digital. Now, why would we do that? Because what we started to note was out there in the wild, all these devices were showing up that people or students could use that didn't explain what, how they were being done or what they were about. You'd get a sensor, you'd just plug it in, and it worked. You got data. You didn't understand how the sensor itself worked. You didn't understand the physics behind the, or the principles behind it or the concept behind of how that data was being collected. So we said, we're going to always start every single lesson plan that we're doing in an analog way, and then we'll scaffold you, and eventually you'll get to the digital. OK, so first thing I did was I hacked Excel in real time and allows me to bring in real time data and streaming it. So this is Excel. I know, it doesn't look like your father's Excel. But what it has is it has a microcontroller attached to it that's attached to a computer and a sensor, and it's reading in real-time data. And so we get live data coming into Excel. Second, we designed a low-cost sensor library for scholars to make their own sensors or to uh, use commercial offerings. So I'm holding up here a flex sensor. This flex sensor, pressure sensor, um, you could buy on Amazon for about $25. Um, it's a little bit smaller, a little more streamlined. But we have kids make their own. It's made out of a piece of cardboard, two pieces of wire, some Velostat, which is a conductive material, and some copper tape and scotch tape. 25 cents. You can make a heck of a lot of sensors for $25 when, you call, when they cost 25 cents each. The other thing is, if you look over here, like our little electroconductivity sensor, that's um, $11. No, 11 cents, sorry. It's uh, $14 if you buy it. But what's super cool is the kids start to understand how the conductivity happens between the two stainless steel wires, because they put the wires into play. They own the development of their learning, and they own the development of their sensors. Third, we partnered with teachers to write our, our, our curriculum. And we convinced ourselves that STEM was really a smoothie. What that meant is you need all four vitamins every time you take one of our lesson plans. You get some science, some engineering, some technology, and some math. They don't come apart. You can't always think about them as separate. Two, we built competence and confidence in asking big questions. We built on the work of Sugata Mitra. I don't know if you know him, but if you don't, go look him up. He's amazing. And we also modeled every single one of our lesson plans to reflect real world skills. So if you're working with our EC sensor, you are a hydrologist. And if you are working with our finger sensor, you're a biomechanical engineer. We called these things by name. We gave them badges and said, at this moment, you are a mechanical engineer. At this moment, you are an electrical engineer. So that for those who needed help modeling what those skills were, we were giving them real life examples in the classroom of what they could be when they grew up. And if they didn't like the biomechanical engineer that week, maybe in two weeks or three weeks from now, the hydrologist was a much interest more interesting job. Or potentially a geologist, or potentially a seismologist. And then we stood up Hacking STEM. 
Um, I'm going to play the video. I'm going to ask for your patience. We're going to cross our fingers, and we're going to really hope there's audio. <laughs> okay, you guys ready up there? Let's try it. One, two. In the 16 years that I've been teaching, I've never not wanted to get up and go to work. Education needs to be for everybody, and the majority of our planet uh, doesn't have the resources that this new technological world requires. Excel is a tool that teachers have used forever in the math and science classroom, and it always has represented stagnant data or past data. But now we're starting to get into live data. And live data is where it's at with middle school kids because it's that instantaneous, ooh, you know, you pump on that salad spinner, wow, that's what it's doing right now. So they can get that feedback, and that really, really empowers them in the design process and their iterations as they develop what they're making and making it better. take your little seismograph and shake it and you see the actual seismogram being generated on the screen. And it's just that sweet spot right now. It's just where they learn and it's exciting for them. Everything that was created was like made from paper plates and plastic cups and a few little wires and some magnets. I'm starting to get into this mindset where I can take these lower cost materials and have projects that are every bit as impacting but a fraction of the cost. I wanted students to understand technology to the point where they would have some voice in how it moves forward, that it's not pushing them around, that they can do something with it and make something of it and not just be subject to it. We try to make sure that every unit has the analog component and then the digital piece. And that way we can provide that option for teachers to keep it simple or go on a deep dive if that's what they prefer. I think that there's kind of a fear of the unknown with this stuff. Really all we need the teachers to do is the same thing we're asking our kids to do. Get in there and dig in and mess around with it and you know if you mess around with it long enough then you're gonna you're gonna get it. And that's where I was. I taught math and science for 14 years and our school didn't have a, uh, any type of technology program and so I was just like hey something's got to happen. So, there are now 25 of these lesson plans. They're all free. When I talk about a lesson plan, I don't mean just a piece of paper that says, ah, oh, this is what you should do, one, two, three. It comes with a student engineering journal. It comes with a line to the next generation in ISTE standards. It comes with the code that you can flash on your microcontroller. It comes with a worksheet already figured out. It has extensions. It also has um, that scaffolding that we talked to from the analog and to the digital. So let me give you an example of one. I brought with me our favorite machines that emulate humans. Um, I am going to switch now, hold my breath. You hold your breath too. And let's hope this thing shows up. And we'll wait, let it do its thing for a moment. Um, and while I do, I'm going to tap dance over here and tell you how the lesson plan begins. So unit is called machines that emulate humans. You are a biomechanical engineer. You have a task to basically design either a prosthetic hand or a robotic arm for one of the astronauts to use in space. The unit starts by first you tracing your hand and learning the anatomy of your hand so that you know about your phalanges. We think that's really important to now have the right vocabulary and the right words. And please keep crossing your fingers that the sh thing will show up. Um, the next is. You build an articulated model of your finger. Oh, come, come, maybe, OK. Um, so you take a boba straw, a felt fat milkshake straw, and you put some cuts in it. We have the kids reinforce the fact that they understand the, the bones, so they put their bones on there. And then they put a little piece of fishing line and a paper clip, and you can see that I actually now have an articulated model of my finger, right? And if you look at how my finger bends, you can see it bends from the second joint, not the first. And if you watch our articulated model, you can see it actually bends correctly. Why? Because they had to come in and build these straws, make these cuts. 
I will tell you, this is frustration resistance. We've never seen anybody cut one the first time. And of course, in this audience, you probably all would. But nonetheless, um, but what happens is that, that they go through this process over and over. Now, the next thing they do is they come and they build this 25 cent sensor that we talked about. Um, and then once they have that sensor, they now attach it to, I've got a little prototype here, this little device. I've got an Arduino connected just to a battery. This is my finger tester. I'm going to make sure my sensor is working. But you can see that they now have a machine that emulates a human. Boba straw is about a nickel. Sensor is 25 cents. Arduino can be used on every single one of the projects, so it's a reusable component. Um, we, if we follow the TSA rules, reusables, consumables, and disposables, um, we believe in reusables um, as much as possible. OK. Um, I could use a volunteer. I saw a young man. Could you come be my assistant? Hi, I'm Karen. Your name? I'm Nish. I'm Nish. Please be my fine assistant. OK. I am going to ask you to please put on this glove on your right hand. Now, what we have here, you know, imagine in the class, five kids got together. Each one made a boba straw. Each one made a sensor. I have gassing taped the crap out of my little delicate sensors. And I'm going to put this on your hand. Oops. Let's see if we can put your, oh, we have a little, I should have bought the little glove. We made gloves for kid size and adult size. I actually brought the adult size. Sorry, can you, are you all the way in there? Maybe? All right. Can you make a fist for me? OK. Uh, oh, we missed some fingers in there. Sorry. Technical difficulties in our model, hand model here. Perfect. All right. Make a fist. Don't move it. OK, ready? Now, open your hand. OK, close it. Open it. OK, so you can see his hand is moving. Now, I'm going to go and start reading the data. I'm going to connect my device. This is our little add-in to Excel. I'm going to start my data. And you can see when he opens and closes his hand, open, close, you can see that I'm actually measuring the flexion and extension in real time of his fingers. Now, what the students end up doing are a set of tasks. Could you squeeze these vice grips for me so we can get ideas on gross motor skill? Right? Use, use that one with the glove on. Awesome. Brilliant. OK. And then we also give them pencils and other tasks to look at fine motor skill. Thank you very much. Awesome. Now, Cool. We gave you instructions. You've built sensors. You understand. You can start to design. You start to go through this. Um, and across this digital divide, come onto the screen. Um, across this, we start to get really the opportunity to see how many skills were in that. So, you know, if you start to come in and, and we look at what did we get, we had some anatomy. We've got some using of models. We looked at structure and function. We did some biomechanical engineering. Um, we had some technology. We did math. Um, one of my favorites is when you talk to the teachers, they do a, an exercise where they have the kids measure themselves and they measure their finger. They measure the straw. And now you have to tell me how tall the robot is, right? So scale and proportion, right? How do you tuck math in? Um, and we even ended this with, at the very end, um, we had the kids play rock, paper, scissors against Excel and collect data. And we did um, statistics and probability. Right, with rock, paper, scissors. And so you can do all sorts of interesting things with a set of boba straws and um, sensors. So I want to show you what happened when a kid then did this. Um, this is Emily. And Emily finished the hand, and she went to her teacher, Mr. Ewart, and said, Mr. Ewart, this was really interesting, but your hand is boring. I want to build an articulated dragon. And Mr. Ewart said, OK, Emily, you're on your own. And he said, um, I, you can't touch the code. She said, I got this. And she came back with a team um, of these are 12-year-olds. And this is what they actually built. Now, same hand, didn't change the code, removed the, moved the servos. 
And you should be able to see that she's got it like a falconer's glove and that the dragon is um, got these beautiful scissor wings and its head moves and its neck moves and Emily is all about the dragon. So super cool. So what's interesting about this? Well, this is one example of a master skill. And that single master skill of making this 25 cent sensor has now actually fed three projects. We've done one with, on a brain gong that's modeled concussions. We just finished a project with NASA and looking at what happens with astronauts and their feet in microgravity. And we have them build something called Astro Socks to protect the astronauts' feet from the, the, the uh, blisters that they get or calluses they get up on space. But it, hopefully it starts to give you this opportunity that's sort of brewing um, and that it's available to start to think about how we can actually tuck these things into the, into the schools. But the biggest thing we found is it's not the kids that need the help. It's the educators. There is a huge, huge gap that's happened where we have in-service teachers that don't know how to deal with this. You talk about a breadboard to them and they think we're, gonna, we're in Europe cutting a loaf of you know, French bread in a, in a hotel. No, a breadboard is a thing that has circuits, and we have got to help our teachers make this gap. We noticed this first in um, the first workshop we did. This is the, we were three tables at a booth. There were, the main table was a city grid, and the idea was you come over here, you make a house with a little LED in it, you bring it to the city grid, you crank on a windmill, and you can light it up, and we can see where there's power. We also had another table where you could make that little seismograph, and you would bring it in, and we'd shake it, and it was a shake table, and we'd read where, which grid the earthquake was. Interestingly enough, gender diversity came into this again, and we had only mostly women come and make the little arts and crafts LED house, and mostly young men and men make the seismograph. And we spent the entire conference walking people between the two tables saying, come on, craft a house, come on, you can do this. So my team stepped back and said, well, what can we do to help this? And so we started a pop-up classroom um, program around the world where we've been now training teachers to not only have confidence in this, but looking at how we can build a, a professional development learning community for them. This last year, we also got one more step, which was we went and we said, we can involve these teachers into, from into engineers and into hackers. And so we set up a one-week hackathon program. Um, one week is Microsoft's, they close the company for a week and, and uh, everyone works on passion projects. And what we ended up doing was we said, the week before hackathon, we'll have the teachers come to Microsoft campus, we'll put them through a week-long professional development program, we'll give them these skills, and then afterwards we'll have them stay for hackathon, partner them with Microsoft employees, and have them develop their own lesson plans. And so I'm going to play for you a quick video um, from our hackathon. Oops, sorry. I'm so proud of myself that I did this. I thought that I'm an English teacher only, but uh, I'm an engineer today. Yeah. English science and math teachers from the United Arab Emirates. Science and math teachers from Davis, Utah. Science and STEM and math teachers from around the Puget Sound. For the last eight days, 107 amazing educators have been attending a STEM workshop here in Building 33. A workshop requested by their ministers of education, their state superintendent or principal, that gives them professional development clock hours for learning how to bring computational thinking, design, and data science and engineering into their classrooms. This workshop gave them hands-on experience writing code, making sensors, analyzing data, and a chance to work with 3D, while also modeling classroom use of our modern 0365 toolset. Our goal, give these teachers enough skills to hack their own lesson plans or student technologies to modernize and democratize their classroom practice. Our hack, with five days of training and partnering our teachers with Microsoft employees, could they come up with new project-based experiences for their students? Could we grow them from teacher to engineer to hacker? First step, set up a hacking boot camp and introduce the teachers to building upon the good ideas of others and hack for good. 
Second step, recruit hackers to come support the teachers. We crossed our fingers for 10, really hoped for 50, and were blown away that by kickoff we had 136 Microsoft employees volunteer. While the teachers self-organized into teams around their passion for a particular big question, the engineers were introduced to the Hacking STEM curriculum. And once they knew what they wanted to build, we held quick pitch sessions where each group got three minutes to lay out their idea. And then with a little bit of matchmaking support, the teams were formed and it was now time to hack. So, awesome. We did it. They were all 16 lesson plans. We did it again this year. We got 14 new ones. They are continuing to blow our minds, these educators. But we're not out of the woods. It's got, the problem actually just got worse. Because where's machine learning and AI? And what are we doing about machine learning and AI? And how are we going to start bringing that kind of curriculum? And I'm not talking about using it to tell us how our kids are doing. I'm talking about giving your, the kids the experience of using these tools in service of what they're trying to do. And I think that we are at this point, at this really interesting moment, where we have an opportunity to really think about what we can give as technologists, as scientists, as people who know and are working on these technologies to help, in parallel, bring our students and the next generation forward. So my team spent and did one of these lesson plans. We said, let's go try and put machine learning and let's try and put AI into a lesson plan. And we did this with our partner, NASA. It's a great story. I don't have enough time to tell the whole detail of the lesson plan, but basically we took a study done by MIT and NASA on understanding climate change using color, and we unpacked it for kids to understand how they, how they figured this out. How could they tell us that the, the climate was changing? The number of steps and the things we had to actually explain to kids was pretty intense. Like, you have to explain hexadecimal math if you're going to start looking at, at using um, color and doing color detection. OK, well, how, where in, where's base 16 in the curriculum? Um, we had to explain biomes. We had to explain um, climate change in general. We had to understand, you know. So the notion of that it's literally just open up the textbook and we're going to get these lesson plans isn't happening. So I want to end by just literally making a request and saying, look, you all have been working on the forefront of technology. We have looked at the curve. We see the pace of change. We see the goodness coming because of technology. Yet we need to start thinking about what we can do for our students to make it so that they actually have a chance to be future ready when they start to graduate from school. And so my call to you is think about what you can do. Can you volunteer at a school? Can you help at a hackathon? Can you join a computer science coding class to help kids or help a teacher? Can you have a teacher in your class come to your office? Can you go to a, your teacher at your local school and ask them what technology skills do they need today? Because we'll work on the, the formal, formal stuff. I'm, in conversations with AAAI right now on the standards. I'm in conversations with ETS on data standards. We're looking at how CSTA can come together and start bringing the computer science standards together. But this isn't a thing a few people in a, in a lab can do alone. And so with that, I'm going to stop. I'm going to thank you for your time. I'm going to open it up for a couple of minutes of questions um, and say thank you. Great, we have some time for a couple of questions. Yeah. 
Hi, Karen. It's a great talk. Thanks for giving it to us. Um, you mentioned the, the interesting story about typing, and I totally agree about typing as a fundamental skill. I took typing in high school, and it was f really important for my career. What's the modern version of typing? You've done a lot of studies with these students. What have you found? Is it soldering? Uh, or what's, what's the equivalent of that? It's sensors. It's sensors. At least that's my hypothesis. But and no, I understand sensors is that a category, but what's the skill? It's what's making the a sensor. It's understanding how you can make and collect and display data. We think about this. We have a generation that's growing up where the big data is a given. Their social security numbers are hacked before they're born, almost. At least mine were done shortly. My kids were hacked shortly after they were born. They grow up in a world where Siri and Cortana and Alexa are all there hanging out with them. They're growing up in a world where people are collecting data and they have smart schools and they have smart cars and they have smart everything. They got to understand how to take it apart, put it and put it back together so that they can own their destiny. They can own their data. And it's not just policy. It's intellectual capital of being able to understand how you can function in the world of data. If and I think it's the sensor. Great question. Yeah, I had one here. Uh, I, I'm trying to understand how you roll this out. Um, this is stunning to me. I, I was really impressed. But it sounds like it's rolled out maybe just by one teacher in a school system. And that doesn't seem to be the way that would be most effective. Thank you for asking this question. I actually, I'm working um, from the bottom up. But I'm also working from the top down. I have partnerships with ministries of education around the world. In fact, um, I was super excited. Uh, the uh, Ministry of, of Mexico, for example, had us come in and train um, seven states of teachers. And what they did was they brought those seven states of teachers. It was about 100 or 200 teachers by the time we were done. And each one of them were charged with training 25 people in their own district. So that trainers training trainers. We also have been really interested in looking at how we take the data streamer component of Excel and have it sort of fit into natural ways into the classroom. So one of the big things we just did was we partnered with Veneer, which is one of the high school academic sensors. And now you can take your Veneer sensor and plug it into your, your USB port, and sure enough, it will read real-time streaming data into Excel. The last thing is, is that we've done training. And we have made training. Um, Super important, not only sort of accessible, so you can come into the Microsoft Store on a Saturday afternoon and walk up and do a STEM Saturday. If you want an instant 15-minute experience, they're running our projects in there. But we also have partnered with school districts and, and um, superintendents, and so we'll have whole school districts that are being trained. One of the most exciting things that happened this year is there's a district in um, Utah, and they heard the clarion call for this, and they have now made a seventh and eighth grade elective called Hacking STEM. They have, at this moment, 1,000 kids in the elective um, with 10 teachers. That's just one instance. So we are seeing it start to scale, but you're absolutely right. This, is, this, this, can't, this can't be grassroots. This is going to have to be a, a much more formalized process. Hi, my name is Karen, and you certainly do motivate us. and. Uh, I found your uh, talk very exciting. My background is I'm a physical therapist and I'm a scientist with the county inspecting restaurants. I teach swimming. I teach beginning piano. I'm basically a teacher. I'm over 50 years old. My question to you is, I probably should have been an elementary school teacher had I been able to deal with the politics of parents. My question is, at this late point in my career, where do I begin? I think you told me volunteer with the local school, but the thing is, people like myself who are allowed five careers per lifetime, lifetime says my college, where do we start and where do we get mentors like you? Well, I'm really honored, first of all, that you want to do this. Um, one of the things that we have seen are there are organizations. I use code.org as an example. They do have that. There is a program that Microsoft runs called Teals, where we send, a, for example, a teacher into the classroom and co-teach that first year of computer science with that teacher to give them some confidence. So the first thing I would recommend is look at your skills. Do a skills inventory and you know, give yourself some credit for what you bring that they may not have in the classroom. The second is, 
um, do look at your local school, talk to your PTA, talk to um, your local um, school board. They do know where people are and they are offering, often asking to have parents or volunteers or community members come in. And then the last is the out of school activity places. We've seen a lot of um, interest in, for example, the Boys and Girls Clubs and the Ys that use these programs to then supplement what they're doing. Um, and so it's been a really, it's really interesting that you ask. I mean, it's not, it's not like a 911 go help school. Um, I guess I also should also make a plug at this moment. Um, donors Choose, if you want to put some money at it, Donors Choose is an amazing uh, ph philanthropic organization where teachers put up hey, I want to take my kids on a field trip. I'm trying to raise money, and they crowdsource to fund teachers to do projects. So if you're looking from a, just a capital point of view, uh, Donors Choose is a good place to find projects like this that could, you could fund. Um, we'll take two more questions right here. Hi. Hi. So I have been recently in charge of tech at several public K-12 school districts. And so I've seen many presentations like this. And this one is especially brilliant <laughs> and dazzling. <laughs> right. So uh, appealing to my own authority to compliment you, right? Thank you very yeah. much. We'll take that. We so, like good so, housekeeping uh, seals of approval. So, so I, one of my questions is, and I, we've been doing, OK, so I know that I've, I've been in this landscape on the front lines now for, for a long time. Uh, how vendor agnostic is, are some of these programs that you're developing? Because there is an ecosystem turf war going on now, as I, I'm sure you know. Uh, that, that's one of my questions. And the second question is, what do you run into as far as obstacles in terms of, of bringing these programs into schools in terms of the overall systems? Because it never, I'm an engineer and a problem solver, not a politician. And so those are the skills that I lack to make these things happen, right? The technology I love, it's actually creating the cultural change. So that's a lot in your questions. Yeah, 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 a right. lot. Save, yeah, right. um, yeah. Let me start with the second one first, which is just the simple fact that textbooks have six-year lives is a problem. Yeah. Technology is, I mean, so if I was a school and I bought textbooks last year, I don't even get a refresh until six years from now. So what technology has changed and who's going to tuck these things into that textbook? But like, that, that's just a problem. Second is, is the notion that we, and this is Karen's opinion, um, how we assess. How do we assess that the knowledge has actually been acquired? You look at Emily, Emily showed you, that girl rocked it. She figured out servos, she knows how the circuit works, she went and actually built patterns, she, she took it to another place. But what do you do in, to the not Emily, right? You don't want to sit there and say, I'm going to assess you on hot glue gunning, right? How do we start to look at how we just judge whether a kid has got it? Is it, you know, is, is it showing that they've got it or not? To your first question, you know, um, I believe that companies can do well and they can do good. And so at this time, the most important question is, who's doing good? And are they using their, what they've done well with to help make good happen? And so you know, I'm obviously from Microsoft, but I'm not complaining that our, my competition is trying to solve the same problem. This is a societal problem. This is an educational problem. At the end of the day, our kids, if they don't have the right skills, what, what's going to happen with our ability to have them take over? I look at this generation, I see what happened in the streets a couple weeks ago with you know, the, the um, global warming strike. I am so relieved that they are vocal. I am so excited that they are telling us what they want. So I feel a certain expectation, regardless of who I work for, to serve them the right materials so they're educated well. And I hope my colleagues in those other companies are doing the same, and I do believe they are. Last question. <clears throat> yeah, I'm not sure how to ask this question, but you know, in some ways, um, you're preaching to the converted here. This is the most technology crazy part of the world, practically. Except your, the audio system, yes. <laughs> but um, I was wondering whether you, A, look at the other side, which is technology is meant to be used by society, 
and there's a lot of societal questions. So there's an arts perspective also on yes. technology. And I was wondering, A, do you look at it at all? And B, what do you think is the status there? I mean, are, are we behind in all education, basically, or just STEM education? Because STEM education kind of dominates the discussion, you know, especially around here. But I've never seen anybody preach we need more philosophers, we need more people who look at the constitution of the country and that kind of stuff, so. That's why I like Fullen. And that's why I chose Fullen as whose philosophy in terms of what kids need. Because it, to me, it was the most well-rounded. If you look at those concepts and you remove discipline from them and you just look at them as concepts, they apply to all disciplines. You should be able to do good critical thinking, whether you're reading literature and dissect or dissecting a film, or you should have literacy and um, knowledge about how you make decisions, which is really a part of the research that goes on in the computational thinking side. Like, there's a way of being able to do structured thinking. And the reason that I said earlier, when Fulton brings in citizenship and character, that is the societal piece. You know, we don't want to sit there and judge and I'm super excited to now potentially get on a bandwagon and now go back and help the arts. Um, don't, don't get me wrong, my heart's still in the humanities, um, despite the fact I'm a woman in science and technology. Um, I think schools all up need help. I think there is a challenge that we have, and I don't know that there's a concerted effort at this moment figuring out how we're gonna approach it. Um, but your, your point is spot on. Um, it isn't really just only STEM. Um, and it really is education all of. Great. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you. The next forum, actually, we have several, two, that are coming up, two in two weeks on October 24th, and that is with um, Henry Chesbro, Hank Chesbro, who is the father of open innovation. He's a professor at um, Cal, and he's going to be speaking with our CEO, Tolga Kurtoglu, and they'll, they'll be speaking about open innovation and, and, and not only what we do here at Park, but then also open innovation around the world with the companies that they work with. Uh, again, that's October 24th. And then also on November 7th, we'll have um, several folks talking about the future of AR, VR, um, IIoT um, in business in, in November 7th. Um, I believe John Mark Fran Frangos uh, was part of the innovation uh, uh, British Telecom team. Um, Francesco Fernari is a uh, founder of a startup that works with BT. And Per Carlson is from the Innovation Research Center here at Ericsson. So uh, mark your calendars. Registration is open on our website. So uh, please, please join us. Um, so, and also we have some um, snacks outside if you'd like to um, go ahead and, and enjoy the f refreshments. And um, if we could have our student volunteer come up, I'd just like to present you with some badges to acknowledge your skills that you uh, would have acquired had you made this. So this is your electrical engineering badge, your mechanical engineering badge, your data science badge, and your commemorative hand badge. And because I just finished this awesome set of projects with NASA, you get a space badge too. <laughs> you got it, brother. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, Karen.